today I'm going to talk about a few things about the mobile web or the things that people say the mobile web could be or isn't or how the native web is better or the native mobile apps are better and these kind of things. The slides are online. They will be available for you later on as well. Um, there's actually notes on them. So each of those, you can actually read the notes as well, which I wrote this morning on the train. I normally try to stick to them, but then I hear my recordings and I said something completely different. But the message is there. So uh, my thing about uh, uh, the web and being at a mobile event here is always fascinating because I've been a web developer for 16 years. And I love the web to bits. I think it's just an amazing media. It's an amazing technology. And where we've come in these 16 years is incredible when I can see what we do nowadays in comparison with what we did in the past. And uh, I'm always annoyed when every few years there's a new technology coming and declaring it dead and unnecessary. And it's quite funny to see those come and go, like Flash came and go, Silverlight went, uh, all these things that basically try to be different but the same. And that's what I want to talk about. But first of all, who am I? I'm Chris, I'm the principal evangelist for HTML5 and Open Web for Mozilla, which means my main job is translating HTML to a lot of people in uh, different environments, how to, how to get what it is, uh, where the boundaries of HTML5 are, these kind of things. Uh, as you can see, I'm German because there's socks and, uh, uh, and, uh, and sandals. And I was a bit younger at that one as well. And there's also a secret about me, people who know me already, are always scared to hear about this, and it's true, there's not one of me, but actually I've got two siblings. I've got a five-year-old sister and a ten-year-old brother. They don't look anything like me. Actually, most of my youth I spent in our basement, because I was the redhead in the family. But they, it's quite interesting to see when you have these uh, siblings that are older, you keep uh, getting things from them that they used before. And in my case, one of the things that made me the developer that I am now was this big box of Lego bricks, where we didn't have any of the instructions anymore what they were up from. It was just a massive box of bricks. And I loved them to bits as a kid. It's just wonderful. You can chew on them, you can throw them at people, or you can build things with them. And you can just put them together and make new things all the time. All these bricks made sense in themselves, and uh, aligned in the right format, Actually, you made something new out of it. And that's how I became a programmer as well. I just wrote random words in it, and out of a sudden, this was something moving over the screen. And something that actually changed the background color, these kind of things. If you wonder about uh, uh, Lego, and you wonder about Google, for example, Google's colors, the logo colors, come from Lego as well. Because the first computer that they used, the, the, the case was broken, and they built a Lego for a case for it. And that's where the color came in. So that's why every designer says, like, where do these colors come from? I want to change them, but they can't anymore. And I'm actually surprised they don't copyright Lego, but I guess it's for Google to find out. So, and Lego at the beginning was just this. It was bricks and some roof bits and some, some round bits, maybe. But it was just things to build with. And this is a 1986 ad from Google, uh, from Google, from Lego. <laughs> and uh, it basically shows this redhead kit, which are always good to show in ads. And... She has this completely random thing, and it says what it is. It's beautiful. And that's exactly what it was for me. I built these bricks, and I put them together, and I went up to my mom. That's a dragon. That's a ship. That's an elephant. That's uh, your mother. That's whatever. You know, it's like I could build whatever I wanted with these bricks, and they turned into my imagination. And in my view, they were beautiful, cool things that I could play with, and I played with them. Problem was that we dropped them. They broke apart, but there was no problem fixing them again. That was the other good thing about them. There was no definition of what things are in the bricks themselves. You had endless opportunities if you had enough creativity and the power to do it. Lego then moved on and became uh, actually more technical. We had like, out of a sudden, we had like uh, little like springs and coils and we had uh, even motors that you can run the thing on and do some remote with a cable on it. And we had like little uh, uh, pneumatics even where you can push things and other things would move. So the technology of Lego became Lego tactics, as they called it back then, where you can build real machines with it and not just bricks. Which was still cool because now actually I could build dragons that flap their wings without me having to think of that. It just I could make them do that. And that was pretty sweet to do and uh, my parents were really impressed as well. Problem was already, they were a bit more expensive. And we had this big block and we, with three children, they're like, no, you're not going to get new, uh, uh, new Legos, forget it. 
And then when I was too old for Lego, now, when I didn't buy Legos anymore, you're never old for Lego, um, they started specializing. And now we got these race cars. And the race cars are just bigger parts that are shaped already. And you cannot do anything else with it. You can make a race car, you can un uh, dismantle it, and make a race car again. Or you can make a race car with something else on top of it. But you cannot turn the race car into a dragon or a house or whatever. Not without breaking it. And of course, as kids, you did that as well. Like, if the thing didn't work, then we'd cut through it, which was not a good idea. But it worked out in the end. And nowadays, uh, Lego has, it's all about branding. Lego has now 27 sub-brands or something like that. There's Harry Potter Lego, there's Star Wars Lego, there's Barbie Lego. They were thinking about Lego for girls. Lego was always for girls and boys. It doesn't matter. And now they're thinking of Barbie Lego. And every new movie that comes out will have a certain Lego. So there's the Batwing and the Joker playing against Batman. So these are great toys, but they're not Lego anymore to me. They're just basically fixed in their state and they're fixed in time. Like in a few years' time when Batman looks different, or, uh, uh, or the Joker looks different, this thing will look dated. The brick never aged. It was just a thing that was there, and you could build things with it. Of course, the, the reason was that, uh, uh, that Lego was almost bankrupt, and Lego didn't do well, and so they had to find a way to, to produce faster, quicker, and things that sell faster, and that's why they started with the specializing of that. Which is, to me, annoying and actually sad, and I'm happy I don't have any kids that I know of at the moment. But uh, it would be interesting to see if the kids really want different Legos than every few months when a new movie comes out. Now, what's my point here? Why do I start talking about Lego? It's awesome, that's why. But uh, the point that I'm making here is that exactly the same thing is happening to apps and technology on the web. We do the same mistake, that, or, or uh, not a mistake from a financial point of view, but the same uh, painting ourselves in the corner in technology at the moment when we try to make apps that are web apps that really only work in one environment and only are meant for one environment. So, limited technology just doesn't sell. That was always the problem with the web. This was last week in our offsite in America. It's like we always, when we have meetings in Mozilla, we always have Lego on the table so people can play with it. Because all of us seem to be kinetic learners. You have to touch something to learn something. So my friend just built this whole loop uh, Super Mario out of Lego bricks and put them there. The problem with the web was we never sold the technologies. Nobody ever paid you for HTML. People paid you for what you built with HTML, for the services that you built, for the products that you sold with e-commerce websites, for the, uh, uh, the beautiful pictures that are inside an HTML and bring out the brand of a company. The technology was not the stack, and the technology was, uh, was not the product. We didn't sell the technology, and because it was just too ugly. It was just didn't do it properly. HTML was meant for, uh, for like, universities to send documents to each other and link them to each other. It was never meant to be uh, there for a beautiful, rich experience that is multimedia. And HTML4 that was. And that's why we had Flash. And Flash came out and actually said, like, oh, you can do these pretty things right now. Cool. So, yay, let's use Flash for everything. And the HTML itself was not the product, but we still tried to make it a product. Uh, but we, it just didn't work out. And then the whole thing started changing when the first smartphone came out. And a smartphone, by definition, when it comes to me as a, as a developer, is actually a bad, bad computer with a really good video card in it. Because the processors are most of the time awful and really hard to actually optimize for and there's not enough RAM in there. Compared to desktops, what we can do on desktops, you cannot do on mobile phones. You just can, uh, cannot access all the things that you want to. And it changed everything out of a sudden because we wanted high fidelity, cool things on those devices. And a certain fruit company from California wanted to sell a lot of those devices. And they had to find a way to sell those devices to people. And just say, you can surf the web on it, and it looks awful because the computer is too slow in it, and nobody builds things for you, was not necessarily their goal. So they had to find something new and something disruptive. And that came actually in the form of apps. The other big problem that we had once we moved to mobile devices was, of course, connectivity issues. This is just an animation of a YouTube loading video, and I... That is one of the things where I have statistics on my blog to see how long people look at that blog post before they actually start writing me emails and get really annoyed with me. 
But connectivity is a massive, massive issue. Like you're always offline on your smartphone. No matter what people tell me that they're like, oh yeah, well, I've got this 4G, 60 million data set, whatever, for 20 pound a month. You're always offline. You're in some train, you're in some house that doesn't work. You need to put everything offline. You need to put everything on slow connections. You have to have technology to realize how fast your connection is. And especially in emerging markets or in, in uh, markets in the Middle East, where you pay a lot for data traffic, it's incredibly important to not send people things they don't need. This was Bruce was talking about that earlier about responsive images. Same with fonts. If I really want to see your website, I don't want to download 3.8 mega fonts just because you thought they were beautiful when I'm on a data plan where I pay £7.50 per megabyte when I'm outside of England when I'm in America. That's not nice. That's not really necessary. So connectivity will be a bigger problem as well. I mean, uh, it's lovely that the iPad 3 has this massive retina display, but our 3G infrastructure is not made for sending that much data right now. We're actually, we're playing for a market that isn't there yet, or one company is playing for that market, and I'm quite sure Microsoft will come in next as well. So we then looked at that and said, like, okay, there's these smartphones, and they come with native technology, so we've got to do something about HTML5. So we've got to do something about HTML to make it an application platform. Des it's not the web anymore. Desktops are dead. That's what basically uh, uh, Apple said. A lot of people believed it, and... We have laptops, we have mobile phones, we start shifting things around. And we needed HTML to move away from the idea, click something, reload it from the server, click something else, reload it from the server. So the first thing we did with that was Ajax, to actually just load parts of the page. And we broke the web a bit with it, but it was not enough. So HTML5, we started doing, we said like, okay, HTML5 now has native video, native audio without having to load a plugin and actually suck the battery empty of your mobile phone and actually not running on it properly and being hard to update, we now had all these things in the technology of the web. We had Canvas where we can actually animate things. We can write games that are hardware accelerated so they don't suck the main core of your mobile phone but actually go on that good video chip and actually get the information there. We had local storage and offline storage. So we actually have things that go offline and you can actually play with them offline when you're in a train, when you're in a tunnel, when you're in somewhere in a house that doesn't have any connectivity. And we had things that actually, uh, that actually didn't make much sense that got out of the specs again. But we basically moved HTML away from a document language to actually an application framework where you can build real applications in it without actually losing the, uh, uh, the lightweightness of what HTML, CSS, and JavaScript was before that. So it was an evolution of that, which was cool. And now we said, like, yeah, great, HTML5. We can build everything on mobile phones, on Android, on iOS. And then basically this happened. Apps, native apps. And native apps to me are these race cars that I showed you earlier. Or actually, sometimes even the branding ones. Because they do one thing, and one thing really well. This is good. End users love that. But it also means that we take web technology and web pages and the idea of putting content on the web and functionality on the web, and we bring it into a closed environment that actually gets sent to a user, much like a download was in the past on the desktop. We started the web because we did not need an app to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. We just went to Google, we entered what is 54 degrees in Celsius, and we got the answer in a few bytes. And nowadays, people say, like, well, I got an app for that. I just downloaded it. It's 2.3 meg over my data connectivity. It was really expensive. When it gets updated every two months, because now it shows different ads, it downloads the whole thing again. It installs the whole thing again. So we actually take, uh, um, we make it easy for end users but we actually give away all the benefits that web, app, web development had in the last 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, no matter what you want to call it. Like, atomic updates are not possible with native apps. And the problem with that is, it's for the end user. The good thing about it is that as a provider, as somebody who offers an app, as somebody who offers an app store, as somebody who wants to sell hardware, you're in full control. You don't have to worry about that somebody else will go somewhere else because this is your native app that only runs on your platform and you call the shots. So we're turning great ideas and great creativity that we have on the web in the, in the past and all the hoops we have to jump through to make things work. 
and we're turning it into consumer products for the web. Little things that get sold. And let's not kid ourselves. Uh, native app development is not about building the next Instagram. It's not about building the next Angry Birds brand thing that you actually can make millions with. You can get lucky. Not many people do. The press, the press tells us that every two days a 12-year-old somewhere in a garage made a new app and made millions with it just on iOS. That was all they had to do. But the real money is in quick apps that get bored, boring after a week. Apps that are small, fast, and are targeted at kids. That kids want to have and nag their parents until they get them. And then a week later, they're bored with them and want to have the next app. This is how you make money. You want proof of that? Just enter fart into either Google Plus or iOS. And you will find so many fart apps, it's not even funny. The people building these great smartphones must be really, really proud that a lot of that money goes into fart apps and other things like talking dog, talking squirrel, talking elephant, these kind of things. Of course, there's creative apps as well. But a lot of it is just like, quick, quick, uh, let's just consume it and go on to the next one. I gave a talk two days ago where I compared native apps to Furbies. If you remember that, Furbies from the 90s, these cool things that talk to each other that everybody needed. Nowadays you find them in a skip or you actually find them in a charity shop, if you're lucky. These things are limited in what they do and they might get outdated really, really quickly and a throwaway, fast turnaround, money-making little apps, which is good. If you want to do quick money apps, fair enough. If you run an app store, great for you. If your app, if your mobile phone is the only one that allows a certain app to run, even better because people might actually buy that phone or the kids nag their parents until next Christmas they get that phone from you. The other thing that uh, when I talk to HTML5 about uh, uh, to, to people who are actually coming from marketing or are owners of companies and come from sales at Mobile World Congress, every single one of them, I showed them really cool HTML5 stuff. The first question was, how can I protect my code? How can I make sure that nobody can download what I have there? How can I make sure that actually nobody can copy what I've done? I'm like, don't release it. Because as soon as this thing is on a screen, people can rip it. People can find things. You can, again, look for angry. You find angry animals. You find uh, angry turtles, angry this and that. These games have been copied millions of times. They don't have to be successful. And if they are, then you can still sue them because it's your copyright, not on the technology level. But native apps give people that idea. Right? You can protect your code. Nobody's going to touch your stuff. Nobody's going to get to your code. This is your stuff, and don't worry about your copyright. Uh, same with streaming, video streaming, TV streaming, music streaming on native, uh, on native apps and also in native platforms. On the web, people are really scared of that. Uh, I know a lot of people in Spotify. I know a lot of people in SoundCloud. It's a big, big problem. YouTube goes HTML5 and actually tries to protect the stream uh, from downloading as well, which is not the idea of open video, but we have to find a solution for that because Hollywood is not going to go for something that can be easily right-clicked and downloaded because obviously making millions of dollars with things like Avatar means that the pirates have won. <laughs> so, does this all sound familiar to you? Because whenever I heard these, these questions and these discussions, I remembered years ago, Flash, same thing. I want to use my font face that is copyrighted my company. I cannot put it on the web because uh, down, people download my font then. How do I do that? Well, you put it in a Flash movie. How can I put my video out on the web? How can I put DRM on my video? You use Silverlight or you use Flash. So the technologies that certain companies that are very much about their native apps set are dead we're actually doing the same thing. So whenever people talk to me about HTML5 versus Flash, it's not really a technology problem, it's more a problem of approach. People who don't want their, their content on the web will stick with Flash because that's the only thing that actually gives them that glass shield protection of saying like, oh no, people can't download it. No technology savvy person would ever be able to open the Chrome DevTools or Firebug and right click that FLV video and save it to his hard drive. That's impossible. Nobody will ever find that out. That there's like millions of add-ons to downloading YouTube content shows that there is a use case for allowing offline content. And some people do it right, like BBC, for example. The BBC iPlayer allows you to download things offline and watch it offline, and it deletes itself after a few days. That's great. Why not? So Flash actually had the same ideals that a lot of native propaganda has right now. 
saying like, this is protected for you, this is yours, don't worry about it, nobody can touch that. What they both miss is that they're not easy to update. They're not easy to upgrade. They're actually dependent on something else. So, of course, it's nice to stay closed and safe. Like when I stay in my, in, my, uh, in my flat and don't go outside, I don't get rained on. That's good. But I don't actually get sunshine. I don't get a, well, I don't get a tan, I'm a ginger, but uh, I don't have fun in the sun. I don't, I don't get experiences that I should get otherwise. And when I'm closed and when I'm in one environment, I limit myself which could be good, which could be if your app actually is perfect for that one use case and you only stayed with that use case, then that's wonderful. And if you really need something that only works on one phone or one environment, that's good too. But you shouldn't see it as the norm, as the best thing ever. Like concentrating on one thing and staying close to the outside limits you in a way that actually doesn't make it yummy. And Aral Balkan kept talking about this. When you think about apps, Think about food. You don't go out and say, you know what, I want to have something edible. You go out and say, like, you know what, I'm really hungry and I really want something that tastes good. Something that's interesting. Something that gives me a flavor that I didn't have before. So you should make things amazing and interesting. And you can do that either by building one simple thing that's amazing and interesting, but that's hard to do and not many people get this right. Or you can keep things open and make a meal out of it and actually talk to other things. One big thing, whenever the tone comes to Android, is, oh my god, fragmentation. Like, oh my god, how many Android phones are out there, and how bad are they? Yeah, it's true. A lot of them are really annoying. I mean, I bought the Nexus S a year ago, now it's actually too slow for Angry Birds a space, because it actually burns my leg, rather than being able to play with it, and eats my battery, and that's sad. But, we had that in the past. These are feature phones, I was at Mojo, uh, um, at Mosync in Stockholm, that's a company that does, uh, uh, does a, a pre-processor to actually build things uh, from HTML into native code. And they had like over 400 feature phones there because before that they did things for Symbian and feature phones in the same way. They had a pre-processor for your C++ code to go into all these platforms. And as web developers, we've always worked with fragmentation. We got used to it. We understand that you cannot expect something to be there. We write code that has a massive if statement around it saying like, if this is there, do it. If not, I give you something upfront that works. And a lot of developers nowadays don't understand that anymore. Like, well, if it's not the fastest phone, then we're not gonna do anything about it. Sucks to be you, please spend another $900 for a new phone. That not everybody can do that. So, Making a meal out of it versus just having a tinned tomato soup is actually the, the benefit of web apps. Because I can talk to other services, I can do updates that are just one level. Instead of having to say like, oh, Angry Birds has new levels, you want to download that 23 meg right now and install it and hope everything works and then it's fine. You can have a, a, a JSON object that's a new level coming in, like in milliseconds, over the line, Quickly. I can send you different levels from one phone with another with NFC, for example. I could do all these really cool things that the web has been doing for years and years and years on mobile platforms as well. With native code, I can't do that because this is not how we do things. Everything is sandboxed. Everything is locked in. This is actually in a cafe near my house. For a uh, £5.10 for tomato soup, nice bread and tea. Always good to have one of those things. So... <sighs> This is when I got silly yesterday night. Uh, a big thing that always people talk about is that native has more fidelity than the web will ever have. Like, oh, it scrolls better. Oh, it moves better. It has all these cool features that the phone has. That's true, and that's totally fine. It's like, but it's also no secret. I mean, if I control the hardware and the software, of course I can build the better, the better tool. I used to write games for Commodore 64. When I wrote it in assembly language, yeah, it was frigging fast compared to somebody who would write it in basic. But that's because I didn't have to go through five levels to conversion to actually get to the hardware. I knew what every part of the chip did. So actually I can do tricks with it and do cool things with it. So the fidelity of, uh, of native environments is actually there because a lot of the stuff is just locked to them. And you cannot compare a web app and a native app if the web app doesn't have access to the hardware. That's just not possible to compare that because it's like comparing a bicycle to a, or a car without petrol to a car with petrol. Yeah, the one with petrol would probably be faster if you start the engine. 
uh, not really that much of a su surprise. And a lot of it is also quite in our heads as developers. At the Mobile World Congress, I showed the Ubuntu Gecko phone to a lot of people. And every single developer started taking it and scrolling and said, like, oh, that's not as fast as iOS. Every single user looked at it, and because the, uh, our <laughs> in that build of Gaia, our, our apps were actually rectangular, they're like, oh, rectangular apps, is that the, is that the, the, uh, the Windows phone? So people just, just said, like, oh, that's a Windows phone, it has games on it, cool. No, it's not, it's HTML5. They should not have to know, because it should be as fast as the others, but as Developers, we get so excited about micro-optimizations and comparing one-on-one -on -one and trying to find something that fails that it just is it's a fetish of ours. I mean, JavaScript is my favorite. I've written four JavaScript books. And when people send me like, oh yeah, I sent these two for loops through 60,000 iterations with 12,000 different objects and the other one was 50 milliseconds faster. And you're like, don't you have a girlfriend? Or is, is what the hell is going on with you? Like, these, especially as these tests are every three months are completely outdated again when something new comes out in the browser, which change nightly. That's what nightly browsers are about. <laughs> so, higher fidelity is interesting, but I wouldn't uh, pay too much attention on it. Because when there's a will, then there's a way. This is a remote-controlled Land Rover built from Lego bricks, Lego parts that you can buy. And it actually does everything the other Land Rover does. It has the suspension, as you can see here. The engine works. It has gears. It actually is incredible. It's remote controlled. It drives like four miles per hour, that thing. It has great videos out there with terrible, terrible music in it. But it's still incredible what that man has put into that. Yes, it was a man. And it's just wonderful to see how when you get a geek at technology and they're dedicated, they can build really, really cool stuff. Because that's what we do as geeks. We just don't stop until something is done. Even if it doesn't make sense, we want to have it finished somehow. So, of course, some of those bricks hurt. I mean, everybody who went through a, bla through a dark room once and stepped on one of those Lego bricks on, in the middle of the room know that. Also, some of them that were broken and basically made your whole car fall apart are not good. And HTML5 has a lot of them at there's a lot of stuff that doesn't work properly. Audio is broken on every browser. It's incredibly bad. And uh, especially in some on iOS, for example, I can play one sound at a time. I have to finish that one sound, and then I can play the next one when I go through the browser, not when I go through native. And for games, having one sound at a time is probably not good enough. And that's why we built these native APIs instead to work around these issues, which then work not on mobile phones again. So even that fix doesn't work. So there's a lot in HTML5 that needs fixing, and it's not being fixed because, uh, um, well, it's fixed on desktops, but on browsers that are in operating systems of mobile phones, they're not being fixed because we make money with native apps, and why would we shoot ourselves in the foot and fix things that don't make us money? This is a bit of a tinfoil hat approach to that, but... It just annoys me that, that, some, that a company that actually uh, claims that HTML5 was the, was the end of desktop and everybody should do that now have such a bad uh, performance when it comes to local host and offline storage in their browser that I can't use it, that I can't rely on it. And that's just not the way HTML5 should work. So the way around that right now, if you want to go for the web approach, uh, is basically to build with HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS, and then use processors, preprocessors, like uh, uh, Accelerator out there, or Nitobi, Adobe Cordova, it's called now, or MoSync, that actually allow you to write HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript as if browsers had all the things that you wanted, and then convert them into native apps for the different platforms, for Android, for, uh, for iOS, and for desktops as well. And a lot of the apps that you see in, uh, in public are actually HTML5 apps. You just don't know it because you bought them on a, uh, on a store and installed them on your native machine, which is cool. And I think it's a good way to deal with things, but it shouldn't have to be, especially as debugging is still a quite, quite a pain at the moment. Adobe Shadow is working on that, and MoSync have a tool called Reload, which is basically a, a, a Node.js server that allows me to, uh, to sync all my devices to the desktop, write the app on my desktop, and when I reload it on the desktop, it automatically reloads it after turning it into native code on all the devices. So I can have like a range of my iPads and 
I play books and Android's there, and when I when I hit a button, it actually creates the thing on my desktop, and then I see them popping up as native as native implementations in those. You can see what's going on. So that's what we're working on, and what a lot of companies are working on, and that's important because uh, people that come from a native environment going to the web missing those tools. They really want to have better. SDKs, they want to have better IDEs. We don't have them on the web because we don't understand them. I use text made of him. That's what I've done for years. That never let me down. And Lego understands that as well, funnily enough. They got this Kuzo project where people can build, they even had a 3D builder, where people can build uh, uh, their own Lego projects and send them in and say, like, do you want to build it? And if you get 10,000 people to say, yes, I would buy that, then actually Lego is building that for them. And that, uh, that, um, uh, that Land Rover is one of them. The only problem right now would cost like 600 pounds or something. So they have to think about something there. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think the idea is amazing. They, they, at the same time, just to make money, they have their closed environments, but they still reach out to the geeks that, like me that loved Lego for years and years and want to do something with it. So what does Mozilla do about that whole thing? And not Mozilla, Mozilla, Google, Microsoft, Adobe, and a few other people as well. Our job was to unlock the hardware, to free the hardware for you to use over the web. And for that, we used the web APIs. We defined standards to actually access things like the battery status. Because sometimes it would be a good idea to test that the battery is only 5% before you start a massive animation. You can access telephony, you can send text messages, you can send telephone calls you can actually access the accelerometer properly. You can access things like NFC and USB over HTML and Java, uh, over JavaScript. And all of these are not implementations in Firefox. They are open standards that we implemented in Firefox, but actually uh, agreed with other browser makers that this is the way to implement them, and they implement them as well now. So it's not a way of like making your browser the best one. It's the only way is to actually make it an open standard that others can follow as well. That's why Android is cool compared to others, because I can actually build stuff on top of it. Best was the Vibrator API, which we renamed to Vibration API, because there was a lot of stupid jokes about it. But it was just, it's just interesting that you can send your phone like meh, 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 meh. And of course, the first thing we wrote was like a Morse code thing that was read by the microphone of the other one and actually talked to each other, which was pretty pointless, but it was quite fun to do from JavaScript. Um, in terms of battery life, another very important thing is, of course, hardware acceleration of WebGL, of Canvas, of uh, CSS animations. So all of these things are now, across browsers, much, much better than they used to be. And uh, one thing that Mozilla came up with is, um, is request animation frame for animations, which actually makes it possible for you to predict animations properly. In the past, when we wrote games in, uh, in JavaScript, we did like 40, uh, uh, 40 uh, uh, frames per second or something like that. You did a, a timeout of like 200 milliseconds and made animation changes. Now every screen is 60, 60 hertz, and that's good because nowadays, back in the days, it was 50 hertz in Europe, 60 in America. Now every screen is 60 hertz, so when you do an update every 10 milliseconds or something, you do updates into nothing and you just suck battery, and you actually make the computer hot without getting anything from it. So request animation frame ties into the hardware to know when the next animation frame is starting in the screen. So you actually never, never send an animation that will not be executed. And the other good thing about request animation frame is that when you have it on a tab in the browser that is not active, the animation stops. If you do a set timeout like it did in the past, the animation keeps running in the background. You wonder why your battery dies. Whereas if the, active, uh, if the tab is not active, then nothing's happening. As soon as you go back to the tab, the animation commences. And that's a very important part of uh, making sure the battery life is long. And let's face it, all of us reload their mobile phones all the time. Mine is almost empty again. So one of the last few things I'm going to talk about is now that uh, with Firefox for Android, we offer an open alternative to a browser that is native tied in with the operating system, because the Android browser is not fun when, it compare, when I compare its HTML5 abilities to other browsers. Chrome for Android is great. It's a beta now, only on ice cream sandwich, not available on a gingerbread, for example. So I hope that Google I.O., where I'm going in a few weeks, will show that Chrome is coming out fully for Android, because I'm tired of the bad browser that's in there right now. Let's not talk about WebKit Mobile, because that just pisses me off. So. 
Our alternative is uh, for Andro uh, Firefox for Android. It's called Fennec as a code name. And we're, we're spending this year a lot of effort to make this a really, really good browser for, uh, for, mobile, for mobiles out there, especially for Android. Because we want to have the same fidelity in HTML5 that we have on the desktop and the same experience that we have on the desktop for you on the mobile phone. It's unfair that the browser is different just because you, you use your phone. And uh, you might realize that this fanatic animal has a small mouth and massive ears. So what we need from you is bugs. We need you to try that thing out and find problems and tell us about them and actually help us fix these problems. So um, if you can, please download it, try it out, try out it nightly on your Android and find websites that break and tell us about them so we know what the problems are. We want to make this the best browser out there and all the research that's going into it and all the fixes that are going into it will be open source as well and will be actually open for people like Chrome and Opera and Microsoft to use as well. So it's an open source browser. It's the only one out there that's fully open source. Uh, Chromium is open source as well. Safari built on Chromium, not so much. And it's, it's a good browser by now. It really, really is fun to use it. For example, Accelerometer in, H uh, in JavaScript, like uh, um, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, was not possible in Android browser. It's totally possible in, uh, in, in Firefox for Android. So um, I think it's a very important step because Firefox originally came out to make sure that Internet Explorer is not the only browser out on the web. And if we hadn't stood up back then and said, like, hey, there's standards, and we actually build a browser according to the standards that is open, I'm quite sure the Internet would not look the way it does right now because we would all be basically in offices using the internet and at home we would still be watching television because we wouldn't have broken it open and made it available for everybody. The next thing of course is to offer a shop front like the, uh, uh, we have the Play Store, we have, the, uh, we have the, uh, uh, the Apple Store, we have got millions of stores for every mobile phone provider out there which are all full of like four or five apps that nobody uses but everybody made a store sooner or later. So. Uh, Mozilla has an open app store which is now open for developers so you can send your apps in and that could be an HTML5 page. All you have to do is write a manifest file to tell us what should be, what should be cached offline and what services you want to use of these web APIs that we have for example. And you can install that from the web with a button as well. You don't have to upload your app into the store. You can just have a button saying like here's the manifest, please suck the data in and make it available through the store to download. So this one will be one of the main causes for uh, Ubuntu Gecko and also for other systems out there. So it will be a completely open web store. I use this picture because it's again in my neighborhood, which is the only porn-free news agent in, uh, in London. And it's a normal, uh, a normal, really bad news agent actually, but he, he stood up to all the magazine providers that sent magazine packs to news, uh, new, uh, to news agents and they had adult magazines in there. And as he's not a fan of adult magazines, he said, like, I don't want to have them in my shop. Well, tough, tough, tough luck. You have them. You, get, you don't get the other magazines if you don't take the adult magazines. So he stood up to it. He went to court. He won. And he was in The Guardian several times. And basically, he's that proud of his shop and wants only good quality in there. And I thought it was a very inspiring little thing to do. And it's quite interesting to see how proud he is about it. And it's the shop next to it is lots and lots of porn, but that's a different story. So, of course, everybody, oh, Ubuntu Gecko, open web device, what's going on there? This is the unofficial logo that we started when Ubuntu Gecko came out with a boot with two geckos, which is not going to be used, but I thought I'd give it some, uh, some air time here because Sean Mattel did a really good <laughs> job with that. So boot to gecko is, a, uh, is an operating system for mobile phones, for an open web device that Telefonica and uh, Francisco earlier showed everything about that, and they have a few here, I have a few here. The idea of boot to gecko is to free the hardware and free the operating system to make a really affordable device. So what we did is we took the core of Android and got away of the middleware. We don't use the Java, we don't use any of the things that are in the middleware of Android, and just put Firefox on top of it. So you go, you got all the device drivers that were already written for Android and already work across the different mobile devices, and you talk directly into the HTML5 engine of Firefox, which is Gecko, without any middleware in between. Everything you see in Boot to Gecko is HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. The operating system itself, the way you extend the uh, the operating system, the way the way you write new drivers is JavaScript. 
the way you actually, uh, you actually extend it and put your own apps in is just a JavaScript and a manifest file. That's why the phone boots in like 12 seconds at the moment and it's probably going to, be, going to be a bit more later on. But it's incredibly lightweight and that allows Telefonica to release a phone uh, at, for the price of a, fe of a feature phone, a smartphone that has, is web enabled and allows people in Brazil and other countries where iPhones are not affordable at all to actually be online and use that wonderful internet that we have on their mobile devices because at home they don't have a computer either. So by next year, Telefonica is going to release the first put together phones in Brazil. And I'm flying a lot in between Brazil and here at the moment to actually talk to developers over there. We're bringing out the whole documentation in Portuguese as well, which is quite hard to do. But uh, the mailing list is open, the meetings are open, the, uh, there's a wiki page on Ubuntu Gecko, you can download it, you can build it yourself, you can run Gaia, the, the interface, the HTML5 interface of Ubuntu Gecko in a browser. You don't have to have a use a mobile phone and brick it if, if something goes wrong to actually, uh, to actually try it out. There's a simulator out there as well. So the whole thing was meant to bring the web to a mobile device, not bring a mobile device to the web. And I think that's going to be incredibly powerful because right now you can only customize the interface of a phone to a certain degree. If you want your logo on top and three buttons under it, with an iPhone that's, not, that's impossible. With an Android there's probably partnership deals that you can do it, I don't know. With Buju Gecko, you run an HTML page and you put that in there and this is your phone. The opportunities that we have with that are incredible. Imagine a kid's phone that just has three buttons, call mom, call school, go for breakfast or whatever. Imagine a phone for the elderly that has massive buttons just to call their different friends. And all these things could be built for a few hundred dollars rather than like fifteen hundred, sixteen hundred dollars for a smartphone that gets outdated and is really hard to upgrade. With, uh, with a few people, very creative people, I'm thinking about other things. Like imagine my phone, when I change my, when I go to America and I put a different SIM card in, I get a completely different interface. And automatically all phone calls that I do from that phone will be routed through vo uh, voice over IP rather than charging me on that card that in America doesn't have free calls. What about if you want to actually, uh, as a phone provider, you want to put the SIM card in and have a different phone experience, have your logo on there, everything quite simply. These things can be done without having to build extra hardware. So it's a completely open web device that allows you to build websites that are a phone interface. And it performs incredibly well. It runs, uh, it runs WebGL. It does all the HTML5 stuff that you want because it's actually Firefox on top of it. So one big request that uh, um, a lot of people have, uh, Microsoft, Google, Opera as well, is an end to monoculture. Because right now, if you're not a mobile developer that wants the mobile web, and you just don't want to understand that there's different engines out there, there's always the like, oh, WebKit is the only engine you ever need. That is utter and totally not true. I'm not going to say angry words here. There is no mobile WebKit. There's a difference between WebKits and iOS, in, in Android, in different parts of iOS, on, uh, on tablets, on uh, Providers put extra things in WebKit to actually make that out there. Just saying one engine is enough is not true. And even if you don't, I, I don't want you to write things for Mozilla. I don't want you, want you to write things for Firefox, for Opera. What I want people to do is not write only code for WebKit and block out other browsers. And this is happening right now. This is happening in stupid ways, like a white button with a white background and white text because the background was a gradient where people only defined WebKit and not even a background color that it would fall back to if the gradient couldn't be painted. So if you find these things, please report them to us so we can actually contact these websites and complain about it and help them fix it. Because a lot of cases, it's a small little detail. And a lot of cases, these things are business decisions. The other day, uh, there was a pistachioangrybirds.com, a, a, a nut-based uh, Angry Birds, don't get me started, but it was web-based, but it didn't run on Firefox or IE or Safari, uh, in Safari it ran, and not on Opera, of course. Why? They tested for a WebKit box shadow. Their test, if a, if a browser is capable of playing a game, is if box shadow is supported or not. This is just like, at the, at they wanted to get it out, it seems. And like, okay, it has a few bugs in the other browsers. Put something in there to block them out so we can release it. 
product managers do these kind of things to us. And we actually, as web developers, then get blamed when it goes wrong. So our job would be then to talk to these product managers and Opera's web openness, which is a great job title, do the same thing day to day. So um, even if you don't care about other browsers, at least have a fallback so other people don't choke on your code. Because when we say now that Safari is the coolest browser out there, that's exactly what people said about Internet Explorer 6 in 1999. And that's why we have these room booking systems, finance software, content management software that you cannot use in another browser but IE. I have a VM on there just for, uh, for my old company. I had to actually put my expenses in that would not run in anything but Internet Explorer 6. So I had to run a VM every single time I put my expenses in. And we don't want the web to be that in the future. Because the web is awesome and it's amazing and it's fast and it's these bricks that, that made me excited as a kid. And we can give these bricks to kids now and make a new generation of makers. This was in Tokyo. And we have this uh, program called uh, Mozilla Thimble to actually teach kids basic HTML and find out that when they see something on the web, they can right-click it and do stuff with it. This is not fixed. These are bricks. These are things that you can play with and put your own photo in and these kind of things. And this was this uh, Japanese kid that everything she coded, she explained to a little Firefox. And she was really excited about that. And I love that to bits because that's the kind of generation I want. I want kids in the future to have the same experience that I had with my Lego bricks, to basically make a dragon out of nothing, make a ship out of nothing, and turn that ship into an elephant, not because I, 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 I shouldn't be blocked out from doing that. I should be allowed to have the simple web technologies that we have now, and my imagination is the only boundary. So if you want to know more about this, uh, come visit us. Uh, we are in, uh, we are in, have an office now for like three months, this person is sitting here all the time. I'm hardly ever there, uh, but <laughs> I try to be when I can. It's on 101 St. Martin's Lane, floor three in London. And it's basically uh, a five minute distance from Leicester Square. And the difference about this one to other offices is it's an open space. We got about 12 people working there and the rest you can come in, sit down, use our wireless, have a coffee, do some code. Talk to us about things that you when you get stuck, Show us some things that you want to partner with. If your company is out in the sticks and you want to have a meeting room for an hour in the middle of the city, just come by. You can get that meeting room. Clean it up a bit afterwards. That would be nice. And I, when we opened that, I thought, okay, within two minutes, they would have raided our fridge and people, were homeless people would sleep in there and things like that. But nothing yet. So when you trust people, trust comes back. And that's a wonderful experience. And so far, everything worked out fine. It's completely open. Uh, well, of course, there's a door and we lock it at night. But uh, you don't have to be a Mozilla to be there. You don't have to be a contributor or a core team member to actually be there. And you can just sit with us and, and have a chat. And that's the cool thing about working for Mozilla. It's just an, a foundation for the web. It's a, we were made to keep the web open, not to sell things. And that just makes me really, really happy because I'm shit at selling things, obviously. So that's all I had. So this was the state of the browser, all the browser vendors there, and Apple was an apple on the table, but I'm not saying more about that. So thanks very much. <laughs>